Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. There are people across time zones who have been participating in this uh, discussion and are joining us from different parts of the world. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you. It's an honor and pleasure for me to moderate this discussion of Session of Horesis India Meeting 2000 on politics and the pandemic. Thanks to organizers for putting together this idea festival of sorts. Uh, before I make my opening remarks, let me introduce a very outstanding panel of academics and thought leaders we have, a veritable intellectual powerhouse representing some of the best universities in the world. Uh, uh, Professor Sumantra Bose, Professor of International and Comparative Politics, London School of Economics and Political Science, United Kingdom. Uh, you can wave when your name is being, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, people can identify. Uh, uh, Dr. Hewon Keem, Aston University. Uh, Professor Anju Sharan Upadhyay, Professor Banaras Hindu University. Prerna Singh, Professor of Political Science and International Studies, Brown University. Maya Tudor, Professor Blavatnik School of Government, Oxford University. So, as you can see that we have a truly outstanding panel. Let me make some opening remarks and lay out, unpack the theme of today's discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, pandemic and politics are not normally associated in public perception as playing politics in a time of crisis is considered devious and morally suspect. But if one goes back to the etymology or origin of the pandemic, it is directly related to politics and democracy, the root word being demos, which it shares with democracy, and polis, which is city-state. Pandemic in ancient Greek means of or belonging to all the people. So people are at the heart of this debate. This etymology, in a sense, illuminates the subject we are discussing today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been more than 100 days of living with the coronavirus pandemic, and this has radically transformed the world we live in, and along with it, the political landscape in which debates and decisions concerning people's welfare take place. It's, it's literally a testing time for humanity, the governments, the ruling class across the world, and for the opposition as well. The political discourse and landscape had changed dramatically. If one re rewinds to just a couple of months ago, two, three months ago, February and early March, when the first coronavirus infections were reported in India, it was a different world, a relatively innocent world uh, in hindsight. Uh, one can call it before Corona BC. Uh, you know, in, in those months, media headlines and politics revolved around issues like citizen, Citizenship Amendment Act, National Population Register, and issues relating to politics and secularism versus communalism debate. After the pandemic struck, a new vocabulary and semantics has emerged, revolving around lockdown, masks, PPEs, vaccines, migrant workers, tablik hijamaat, and economic recession. Public health and governance issues have moved to the top of political agenda and political discourse. In a sense, the present moment is about mask and unmasking. Mask stand in for public health and unmasking stand in for exposure and disclosure based on the assumption that maybe possibly scandals and stories of gross corruption and mismanagement lie buried beneath the veneer of public caring and welfare. The government of the day may like to invoke the argument of national unity and talk about let's move beyond politics in the name of larger national interest. But given the sheer magnitude of the crisis, it is extremely crucial for the opposition to play its moral as well as political role to relentlessly interrogate the government by highlighting issues of concern as well as offering constructive suggestions for mitigating the crisis. Opposition has to reinvent itself by pursuing creative and constructive politics. Millions of migrants trudging home at the beginning of the pandemic. Millions of migrants trudging home at the beginning of the pandemic crisis is the most defining image trope of the past post-pandemic India. This is clearly not the time for politics as usual, but a new kind of creative and compassionate politics. 
can the opposition of India rise to the occasion and show us the way out of all this gloom and doom? This is the big overwhelming question we are going to be addressing in this debate. With these remarks, may I now invite the first speaker of the day in our session, Professor Maya Tudor. She's going to talk about, uh, Maya, you may like to focus on what you consider is the rightful role of the opposition in this, moments of, in this moment of uh, the national crisis, as it were. And also, please address yourself to the question about, you know, when we are talking, it's, it's, it cannot be politics as usual. Probably we need to imagine a new kind of politics, uh, uh, probably a more compassionate, more creative politics. What's your take on that? Right. Good morning. Uh, well, it's still morning here um, in England. So um, thank you, Manish. And um, I will just uh, talk in general for a few moments about um, the central role of political opposition in holding governments accountable for pursuing the common good, um, which they do in any democracy. I think this is worthwhile spending just a moment thinking through. Um, though elections promote government accountability, a democratic government is held accountable on a day-to-day -day basis by political opposition, whose fundamental role it is to effectively scrutinize the elections of government. And it's helpful to lay bare the reasoning for this, independently of COVID or even of India. In any context, political opposition ensures that the elected government is in fact pursuing the common good. So uh, famously in the United States, um, American Secretary of Defense, Ernie Wilson said in 1952, what's good for General Motors is what's good for America. Equating the interest of a single company with the interest of the country. Um, of course, in India in uh, the 1970s, some, a similar claim was made. Indira is India, India and India is Indira. Um, but it's actually the role, crucial role of government to hold a government of political opposition to highlight whether what the government projects as being in the common interests of the, of the people is in fact in the common interests of the people. So, you know, Madison wrote famously in the Federalist Papers, the problem is first in getting government to govern and in the next place, obliging the government to control itself. And it's in that second part, making sure that government is really pursuing the interests of the people that an opposition is so crucial in a democracy. So in thinking about how the role, what the role of the opposition has served since the COVID outbreak, I think it's also helpful to start off in the Indian context about th in thinking about what the Modi government did before COVID broke, uh, broke out and, and to what degree anything has changed. So prior to the COVID outbreak, the Modi government had, of course, created the perception that any dissent, uh, any political dissent at all, was anti-national. And this is particularly dangerous because in nearly every single case of democratic breakdown that's been led through political processes rather than a military coup, that logic, that dissent is problematic, that it's anti-national, and that idea being broadly accepted by the public has paved the road to a breakdown of democracy. So all incumbent governments have huge incentives to align their ideas of the common good with their own interests, that is, in maintaining power and in winning elections. But again, that's why the role of the composition is, is crucial. So before the pandemic arrived, of course, Modi uh, and the BJP won the 2014 election on this two double uh, strategy of uh, Hindu nationalism combined with effective developmental management. But in the, de in the first term of Modi, um, since the economic management did not yield uh, positive economic gains, um, the Modi government doubled down last year um, with in, in ways that I've, I've written about and in foreign affairs and other places about the substitution of what has historically been an incredibly inclusive nationalism, especially when one looks in the neighborhood of South Asia, even when one looks comparatively to East Asia. Indian nationalism has historically been an incredibly inclusive national narrative. Now, the Modi government since the pandemic, 
what let's take a, a broad look at the response and i we've I've been asked to limit our our comments to just a few minutes so i just want to focus on three um, and then i will conclude the first is to just give credit where credit is due uh, the Blavatnik School of Government has a stringency index in which we track uh, over 100 countries on how they've done um, uh, when they lock down uh, at, at the time of the first death and the extent of stringency. And actually, India looks very good on those indicators. Um, it locked down quite early, as the number of other poor, um, poor countries or, or lower middle, lower middle, middle income countries. Um, so it did a good job of locking down early. The second point that I want to make, though, is that the government has taken a number of decisions that were entirely disastrous in terms of response. Most notably, the decision to lock down without making any preparation for the hundreds of millions of migrants who had to, of course, return from primarily urban areas to rural villages. Um, and that meant that um, because cities were the hotspots, the initial hotspots. In fact, this has been known as kind of, in many ways, the pandemic has turned the ideas of pandemics on their heads because it began, these, this is a disease that began among the wealthy. So it was taken from wealthy urban centers into rural villages. And in Odisha, 80% of the caseloads were from the millions of informal workers who were left to their own devices to return to the villages. And India, has, and this is a, a kind of a related point, has the lowest testing per capita in the top 10 countries. And that very much flies in the face of the WHO guidance to test, test, test. And then the third point is that it has doubled down upon this idea of Hindu nationalism um, and the Tablighi Jamaat, which, which Manish has already mentioned, has been a core part of it. Now, no one suggests that this was a good idea to get together. Um, but it's notable that this was not just happening in mosques, it was happening in weddings, it was happening in um, in, in, in festivals in some, um, some states in India, um, and those groups were not maligned. It was the Tabligi Jamaat was not only um, made quite prominent, but the government then took the political decision to quite um, to, to overtest that particular group, the result of which um, was that proportionately Muslims were overrepresented upon that very small group that was tested, which of course was a political decision. Um, and we've seen some BJP members trying to link the virus with Islam by distributing, for example, saffron colored flags to Hindu food, food vendors. So, you know, broadly speaking, um, I think we've seen a doubling down of both the Hindu nationalism um, and um, and the idea of, of dissent. And that the, the, the last point, this is troubling because of course, on the 4th of May, the government mandated that anyone who uses mass transit install their contact um, tracing smartphone app and around the world, uh, watchers of, of kind of um, uh, private have, have criticized this app on privacy um, concern basis. So I think to conclude the role of the national opposition is all the more important um, because the necessity of a coordinated response, right? And I think um, Prana Singh is going to speak to a moment to the role of federal government um, and that the, the how state responses have been different. Um, but if you look again at, you know, we've seen a number of federal systems, Germany, India, and the United States, um, all federal democracies where health is a sub-federal responsibility. Um, but you've seen across these cases, effective governments have actually seen a great deal of coordination. So in Germany, notably, um, where the lender are responsible for uh, for taking decisions into health, the central government called into, into being a coronavirus co cabinet that um, shared information and that took decisions collectively. Um, so whereas in India, there's been very, very little of that. Um, the Atlantic science writer Ed Young has examined India's patchwork resp uh, response and called it a, a, a patchwork pandemic because it's so different uh, by state. Um, but I think that highlights um, the role of the national government in coordinating these states. Um, as a, as a, um, Nigel Farage said in the case of the UK, right, to, to a certain degree, we're all nationalists now because even within the European Union, you saw nationalist borders go up. And the role of the national government, and importantly, of the opposition scrutinizing the national government, is, um, is it has become all the more important. So I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, Maya, thanks for your comments.
Yeah, okay. Uh, I would like to urge uh, the speakers in the panel to be really, really brief because otherwise we'll have no time for questions. I see uh, quite a few people uh, putting out questions here, so I'd like to take some of them as well. Now I turn to uh, Professor Sumantra Bose to address this critique that, you know, essentially that the opposition performance in India so far has been quite lackluster, that they haven't got their act together and they haven't been able to make any dent, you know, uh, make make any visible impact. Please be brief, uh, two or three minutes max. And I you at that point, and you must stop. You know, we got yeah. a ruthless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, 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 I'll be ahead. just uh, don't be yeah. foolish. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, greetings from Calcutta or Kolkata, as it's known now. Um, well, uh, Indian politics has been at uh, an inflection point, to use a worn phrase. Uh, for the last one year at least, uh, since the outcome of the 2019 Lok Sabha election. And the big issues facing the future trajectory of uh, Indian democracy can, I think, be summed up in three questions uh, in a way. Uh, is it going to be strongman rule or a decentralized democracy? Is it going to be uh, a kind of brute one-party dominance, or is it going to be a competitive and robust uh, multi-party system? And third, uh, but by no means least, uh, is India going to be, in some partial way, uh, a secular state, or is it going to be replaced by a Hindu nationalist Republic. So this has been going on for the last one year. Um, politics is about uncertainty, um, as we political scientists tend to say, and that uncertainty has been aggravated by this uh, grotesque uh, pandemic, and specifically and particularly its uh, economic fallout. And uh, that's true of a range of countries across the world where this tragic situation, the pandemic and its economic consequences for livelihoods and incomes has in a way thrown a lifeline to uh, otherwise uh, floundering oppositions uh, to entrenched uh, strongman and uh, authoritarian regimes or would-be authoritarian regimes of various sorts. Um, we'll have to see how this evolution takes place in India, but I would say at this early juncture that there is a chance for the opposition to get its act together. Now, whether that will happen or not is, uh, is a one crore or a thousand crore rupee question. Um, there'll be a number of factors influencing the evolution of Indian politics in the next one or two years. Um, but I suspect that the single biggest issue will be uh, in James Carville's in a famous construction from uh, the 1992 U.S. presidential campaign. Uh, it's the economy, stupid. Um, and of course, we all know that the Indian economy was faltering badly uh, even before the pandemic uh, hit. I would suspect that Mr. Modi is potentially vulnerable to the economic consequences of the pandemic in India precisely because he has projected himself as uh, India's you know, one and only development messiah. So he has put himself on a pedestal and people who put themselves on a pedestal are prone to falling off it quite abruptly when things turn sour or don't go as they are supposed to. Um, I also agree very much with the moderator's opening remarks that the need of the hour is a more compassionate genuinely inclusive in reality, as opposed to the rhetoric, a more compassionate and genuinely inclusive politics. But frankly, I'm skeptical whether that will come to be in the Indian context. 
um, all indications are that it's going to get, if anything, nastier, more adversarial um, as we go on over the next you know, one or two years, culminating in the spring 2024 general election. Um, I say this because all indications are that the present ruling party will forge ahead with its core agenda, um, some of which uh, Maya Tudor already talked about, so I've talked about, so I will not recapitulate that, while the opposition, which does sense an opportunity, despite its fragmented, disparate uh, nature, will try to use the pandemic and especially the economic fallout of the pandemic uh, to fight back uh, to the ruling party. Um, about the opposition, and this is really my final uh, comment, um, I will say that um, the opposition is now a collection of parts, you know, rather than any kind of whole. You know, when you think of the opposition in India, you know, I used the, the adjectives fragmented and disparate already. Some would add hopeless, you know, to that list of adjectives as well. Um, however, um, I think there are parts that do function in their own local environments quite effectively and quite strongly. And if those various you know, disparate parts, uh, at least a critical mass of those disparate and fragmented parts, can come together in some kind of a coherent whole, then I think the game is on. And we are going to have... Uh, a genuine you know, struggle for the soul and the future of India's democracy unfolding in the next one, two, three years. And those big questions will be at least somewhat answered. Strongman rule or decentralized democracy, one party brute dominance or a robust and competitive multi-party system. And uh, at least in some sense, you know, however, however partial and in, imperfect, flawed uh, secular state or um, a Hindu nationalist republic. I'll All leave right. it at that. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks. So, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, your broad point is going to be more combative. It's going to become more abrasive as we go along. And in the middle of that, we go to negotiate a new kind of politics. Now I turn to Professor Prerna Singh to talk about center, the interplay of center-state relations, which have been in focus for quite some time. In fact, Prime Minister Modi initiated at every phase of the lockdown, is having discussions with leaders from other political parties, from the states, and it is apparently this consensual process, uh, after uh, this consensual, uh, this consultative dis, uh, uh, process that he takes uh, a larger decision. Also, there are acquisitions and counter acquisitions. Uh, can you give a sense of how this interplay of state center relations impact India's handling of the pandemic? Over to you, Brenda. Thank you so much, and good morning at the crack of dawn uh, from the east coast of the U.S. And um, I just wanted to follow up on some of the comments that have already been made um, and really talk about the fact that India is a federal democracy. And in the Constitution of India, uh, health is a state subject, which means that the primary jurisdiction over health lies with the, with the state-level governments. And here, responding to the topic at hand um, and to some of the comments that have already been made. At the national level, we have seen, uh, in a way, a continuity um, with pre and post pandemic politics. So, responding uh, to Mr. Chan's comments at the beginning, on the one hand, uh, today the political landscape uh, of masks and quarantines and social distancing, that vocabulary, sounds um, on face value very different uh, from that of Shaheen Bagh and of the riots, or rather the program in Delhi. Um, if we talk about the Citizenship Amendment Act, the National Registry of citizen, uh, Citizens, but the one thread that continues um, across these 
pre and continuing pandemic politics is this core agenda of an exclusive Hindu nationalism. And what I want to point to is how this, how a particular state in India, uh, talking about the role of federal politics, has in a way bucked this trend. And so while at the national level there has been, um, as has already been referred to, a communalization of the pandemic associated uh, with the you know, irresponsible but not unique event of a religious organization continuing uh, with a large mass gathering. But on the other hand, uh, it's important to note that the single largest number of WPs came from the state of Kerala. Kerala is India's uh, most religiously diverse state, and it is also the state that has made international headlines um, along with countries like Vietnam and New Zealand for having one of the most effective responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And what I want to to um, just argue here is the importance of how a pushback against this exclusively defined Hindu nationalism is perhaps the best immunity against COVID-19. And so early on, uh, the Kerala state chief minister announced the virus has no religion. And so when these tablikis returned to Kerala, there was no stigmatization or blaming of them, even though a number of them did test eventually a positive for COVID-19. Instead, there was this very forceful idea that the virus does not discriminate by religious groups. It's a threat to us all. And there was really this idea of a kind of building of a collective response to what is a collective threat. And I think this is a really important um, point about the essentialness of a solidaristic politics, uh, rather than this kind of fragmented, exclusively defined, religiously polarizing discourse and politics that has come to characterize um, the Modi government, especially um, in its uh, kind of second uh, taking control of power after the elections um, last year. And so the, the main point uh, that I want to kind of mention is that it's, you mentioned at the beginning, um, Mr. Chan, that, you know, the politics has this kind of order of being corrupt and slightly negative. And so we shouldn't be thinking of playing politics um, in, the, in the context of a kind of existential threat uh, such as that posed by COVID-19. But what I want to point to is that a solidaristic politics that's driven by an inclusive idea of who belongs can also actually be an extremely powerful tool. Uh, and so an inclusive politics um, can be an immunity against this virus and is an important um, aspect of a lot of the more successful state level responses um, as epitomized by the state of Kerala. I mean, thanks for highlighting, uh, underlining once again, the imperative for a, for an inclusive response, you know. And, uh, you know, this whole secular criminal divide debate is very unfortunate. We'll come to these issues if we have time. Now I turn to Dr. Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim, uh, you know, uh, one of the things uh, they say, again, I come back to this, that uh, that idea that only, you know, we have a saying in India that only cricket and war can unite India. Now, with all that India-China tensions, that is proving to be true. And now coronavirus uh, has proved to be a unifier. But some critiques, and I see some questions uh, from the audience, that pandemic has also polarized India because of the kind of political uh, politics being practiced by opposition politicians. And when I say opposition, you know, it's important to also underline here that uh, BJP, while it is a ruling party at the center, it is also opposition uh, party in states like West Bengal, which is turning out to be an arena of uh, intensifying political rivalry. How do you look at uh, these issues, you know, uh, and what's your take on this? Over to you. Uh, yeah, thank I haven't a clue, but then since I'm not seeing anybody on the screen, like, have you asked me to speak, Mr. Chan? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay. All of a sudden, nobody was visible and I couldn't hear a thing. I can't hear you. Mr. But I'm not me. 
I can't be Mr. Chand has to open. Mr. Chand, Manish, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yes. Was, was that a question to me or Professor? Yes, yes, yes it was a question for you. Oh, okay. Okay. I think uh, perhaps one byproduct of the COVID-19 crisis is that opposition parties are finding it increasingly difficult to hold governments accountable. Uh, opposition leaders have been critical of the government's responses uh, to the pandemic or communalization of the public health issue, but not to the extent of providing constructive criticism or putting restriction on the arbitrariness of the ruling party or safeguarding liberty and rights of the people. Uh, especially during the lockdown period, a vibrant opposition was missing, and I'd like to highlight uh, two reasons for the opposition's failure in this regard. The first one is the ideological reason that the opposition is devoid of, devoid of ideology that people can relate to or lack of strategy to counter the BJP at the national and the state level. Since May 2014 uh, general election, uh, the BJP's authoritarian nationalism and Hindutva, which has been accompanied by welfare policies, has been the mainstream state ideology, and all, all other conceptions of nationalism are relegated to the margin. The failure of the opposition, especially the Congress, to offer a meaningful alternative to BJP has posed limited challenge to the ruling party. Because Congress ideology has been compromised in the past um, during the Congress-led UP government in the last 10 years, it has been easy for the BJP to outmaneuver it. And whenever incidents targeting socio-economically disadvantaged Muslims took place after Modi came to power in 2014, uh, for instance, in the cases of the viol violation of the anti-conversion laws, Garwapsi practice, and the cow protection movement, which led to the mob lynching of a Muslim man, U Muslim man in UP, and the love jihad rhetoric, etc., the opposition parties uh, responded with a varying degree of commitment, but in the last six years, they failed to check the excesses of the BJP. And since its electoral defeat uh, in 2014, the Congress has, uh, has tried to downplay its secularist image and present itself with more pro-Hindu sentiment. And also, Amadmi party were forced to acquiesce in varying extent to uh, BJP's brand of nationalism in order to win popular support. So a crisis can both strengthen authoritarian populism and it has the potential for its downfall. And the second reason for the opposition's failure can be found in the structure, political structure. The centralization of power has been visible over the, over the past few years and the pandemic has clearly accentuated them. Um, the Prime Minister's decision to impose a national lockdown on 24th of March came at a few hours' notice, and there is no evidence to prove that he had consultation with other political leaders. It was uh, only after the big national lockdown announcement that Modi consulted with chief ministers. And the manner in which the lockdown was executed and the unilateral decision making by the prime minister raises a very serious question to the procedures and processes in the largest federal democracy. And the parliament has been adjourned and bypassed by, uh, by the prime minister during the lockdown. And it is worth noting that parliament and its committees have not met for over two months. And the prime minister has spoken to the public via national addresses, which not only means the absence of scrutiny of the government actions, but also the absence of a cross-party forum to discuss and coordinate between parties and states. Uh, this top-down and one-way communication by the prime minister during the troubling time represents a systematic delegitimization of different viewpoints. And this was perhaps one reason that opposition leaders were limited in their uh, performance. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize that both government and the opposition could have created an enabling environment for discussion. If you look at the experience of other democratic countries during the lockdown, uh, political leaders have been questioning the government action and, the, and policies via video conferences, and they have adopted a hybrid model of in-person and video attendance. So by introducing these measures, I think the government could have responded to the pandemic and could have communicated with the political uh, opposition leaders as well as the public in a more uh, disciplined and effective way. Uh, all very valid points. We are really, really constrained by time here. Uh, let me turn to Professor Anju Sharan. And uh, 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 
And do uh, tell me what is your take on this perception that uh, pandemic has polarized India? And one of uh, 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 somebody from the audience says people are more divided by this virus. Why the pandemic makes it look like nobody is in control in India? Is that happening according to you? What is uh, opposition doing about it? Very brief. Actually, three minutes, I'll take two, three questions later. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for. Uh, Calling me in. Um, greetings from Varanasi, uh, the constituency of the Prime Minister. So I'm expected to kind of be softer and milder uh, on the PM, uh, which unfortunately I may or I may not. Uh, well, in terms of you know the pandemic dividing the country, I wouldn't like to agree with that. Uh, there are studies to prove that the social divisions they get enhanced or enlarged during crisis and that's how i perceive this whole thing to happen initially there were already disengagements with the minority communities starting with the caa and that got enhanced with the tabligh episode but sure enough the concern or the the widespread animosity or you know spatting uh, which was prevalent in the early weeks of april soon got milder towards the end of the april uh, especially with the evocation of the prime minister saying that no this is something that cannot be attributed to one particular religion and mind you across south asia also i was following what happened in bangladesh there were similar responses in bangladesh about a, a krishna consciousness group that you know assembled and did a similar thing uh, and there were you know spats on that uh but sure enough that is something that doesn't define the entire unfolding of the pandemic to me it was yes initial but then it died down that then it faded away so to speak um i was about to flag uh, the kerala example like you know uh, maya mentioned about the the pandemic being the sorry the lock down being declared at a very right time and i would only like to compare the new delhi's decisions with the decisions of some of our own states 29th Feb january was the date when the first episode figured in and by 3rd of february kerala was in control so to speak had already got a special uh, you know provision in place had already got its uh, you know uh, thing uh, floating so whereas the, the center waited for not only the entire february but also almost entire march which may be could have you know kind of uh, been done better on the role of the opposition for sure i would agree with uh, you know maya when she says that there has been of late a, a, a you know in sense of insecurity whether well founded or not uh, but there has been a sense of insecurity amongst people who uh, would you know be critical or would like to uh, you know engage with the uh with with the political unfoldings of the country or with the democratic processes and that has uh and they have been changed or they have been kind of you know put to place so to speak in many cases so that has actually of late diminished the opposition also there are certain cases that have been put out as demonstration cases that actually makes the opposition very very unsure and insecure about itself so yes the opposition is in a disarray but there are various kinds of this this this, this uh, you know uh, not being in control so to speak uh, one of course is that the the cadre strength amongst so many political parties that we have and we have a plethora of them thousands of them is not a match or not a patch so to speak to the party in power's uh, cadre system but there also other things that i would like to flag out here considering that the time is very short and that is the the drawbacks that are likely to have a spillover and also the plus points um one such thing which one perceives is or rather one is scared of is the continuation of a surveillance state like arogya setu is great and this is really needed in this time of pandemic to trace out people who are having infections and are likely to you know kind of spread those infections but you know research has proved that once a, 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 a you know system appropriates uh, some powers then it is very you know reluctant to give it away so my concern as a political scientist is about 
the that I have is uh, about uh, you know the the you know lack of consciousness that we have in decentralization uh, i mean lack of faith that we have in decentralization but on the plus point i think i would like to flag one particular issue and that is maybe one good thing might come out of it and that is the concern for human security might become an important thing given the the migrant issue given the way the migrants were fueling the industry and uh, trade and commerce so maybe the pandemic will you know kind of move our focus there uh, so these are some of the things that i can just put across in these two and a half minutes that i have used here on this platform and uh, let's see if Thanks. we can go we forward have, uh, a bit uh, thank you so much here for very valid points we have uh, three minutes, 14 seconds to be precise. And I'm going to go very quickly. Uh, I know it's very unfair to this kind of discussion, but uh, I mean, I thought of coining something called opposition performance index or score. Very quickly, all of you, on a scale of one to 10, uh, how would you rate the opposition in India? I mean, you know, they have they fulfilled the primary duty of being the watchdog, of being the interrogator. I start from. Uh, Professor Bose, please, no comments, because we really don't have time. So on scale of 1 to 10, please, go ahead. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure the question is entirely fair, because in that case, uh, I should be asked to rate the, the central government as well, right? Uh, um, you could be doing that as well. You could as well. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a very complicated area, but, you know, we're talking about the role of the opposition. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, uh, the chief minister of my state, you know, Mamata Banerjee has been saying that given the critical situation we are in, this is not the time uh, to pursue, you know, partisan uh, politics. But of course, uh, Mr. Chad, you made a reference to West Bengal. And uh, there we know, um, uh, well, uh, Mr. Amit Shah said in 2017 quite clearly that his job would not be complete until the BJP dominated India from panchayat to parliament. And every state in India had a BJP government. So, um, you know, that's what they are trying to do. And there is this regional party which is in office in West Bengal that is trying to fight back. You know, people will decide. But all I can say is that I do remember the 1980s, the growing authoritarianism of the center. And what kept that at bay to some extent uh, was that there were a few uh, opposition ruled which eventually uh, 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 threw up uh, uh, some port coherent national alternative to the Congress. So the worst possible outcome is an opposition free India. So I would hope to be in a situation in a couple of years time when I can give the opposition India, if not 10 out of 10, at least 8 out of 10. All right, very quickly, just a score, no comments, please. Anyone want to go ahead with this or, you know, uh, 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 Maya, what, what is your rating? Just a rating, please. We really, we had no time. I'd give the opposition a 6 out of 10 and the incumbent government a 2 out of 10. And I would say the question is not fair, primarily because the media isn't free enough to scrutinize the government. Right. Uh, right. So we, uh, and you want to go ahead, one of you, uh, Prerna, Anju Sharma, Anju Sharan, sorry. I think I just want to agree with the point that, you know, an, a rating of the opposition, because the opposition's job, as we have uh, spoken about, is to hold the government accountable, is inseparable um, from the role right. of the government itself. And so insofar as the government has done, I think... I can't hear you, Mr. Champ. Mr. Chan, no one can hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Yeah, what I'm saying is that our time is up. Uh, so we got to end this. This is a, a subject that can be debated endlessly. I think this. Can, can, I, can I come in here for a minute, please? Sorry. Sorry. I'm making the remark, otherwise, we are just blanketed out. So essentially, I mean, let's look at this as a prelude to uh, more such discussions. 
more lively discussions of this kind is more like an appetizer the main course is yet to come i just want to end up uh, uh, end this discussion uh, with a uh, with a poem a nigerian poet has written about oneness that is we all need just one dream one day one hour one minute one second one moment to be together and completely unified uh, in a in a uh, you know in a purpose in what we uh, stand to do and i think it's it's time for everybody to get together but opposition is going to be uh, there's there's a huge responsibility uh, for on part of the for the for the opposition to play its role ask really difficult questions and uh, like uh, coming back to what i said in the beginning about a new kind of creative constructive and compassionate politics because my my assessment is that if we do not if the politicians just are seen as indulging in games then their standing is already diminished so much it'll further erode their standing and to that extent their effectiveness thank you all for joining me in this discussion uh, uh we'll uh, and look forward to seeing you once again on a platform like this thanks thank once you. thank you